Welcome back, everybody, at the Privacy Conference 2020. This is the first panel of the first day of the conference, and it circles around um, an important question, uh, which is not only about compliance, it is more about the effects of compliance and the effects of the law uh, the compliance is related to. Um, we want to ask how to enable data protection as a driver for the data economy. I think in the program there's no, in the schedule there's no question mark after that headline and perhaps we also can give hints on how to enable um, it as a driver. Um, we um, have eminent experts here on this first panel of the day, representing the voices of industry and of law enforcement and supervision on member state level and union level. Um, we have Eva Guardian eisenloher with us, She's a senior legal executive and former group data privacy officer of Bayer, one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world. And let's welcome Anna Morgan, um, who is head of legal and deputy commissioner in the Data Protection Commission of Ireland. And we are joined by Wojciech Jaworowski. Since last December, he is the European Data Protection Supervisor. So this is a rather decentralized conference. We are in Berlin, in Brussels and Dublin and uh, directly here with you um, via a service provided by the data economy, perhaps we could say. I'm happy to moderate this session and um, as a start um, and instead of opening statements, um, I would like to ask the same simple question to all of the panelists looking at the, at the state of being. Um, what do you think from your background and from your specific point of view, where has the recent data protection law brought us so far? What have we already achieved in the European Union with this new law? To what extent has the GDPR enabled fostered the European data economy so far. Um, Eva, please start. Well, thank you for, for asking me. Um, from an industry perspective, and this is not specific to, to my company, but in general, I think the, the GDPR and the parallel laws that come about all over the world right now have a couple of benefits for the data economy. A very plain one, I think we've never talked so much on data security as we talk these days, because nowadays if something goes wrong at that end, so data protection is at stake, colleagues have on the GDPR quite stringent reporting requirements and also fine uh, enforcement opportunities or threats uh, in front of them. So, so already the data protection part, I think, has, has been reinforced through the law. What I would say from an industry perspective, and there again, I can't talk for just our house, but for, for numerous companies, I think GDPR has helped us to address data as an asset. Uh, personal data, other than patents or uh, any type of IP, regulatory information that companies used, was never so much in focus as it is now in GDPR. And people have started to actually figure out where does it come from? What's the legal basis? What can we use it for? And by the way, where is it? Who's in charge? So the overall approach to personal data as part of the data economy has been reinforced through the law because we actually have to think about where the data is, what we can do with it, and what we want to do with it in the future. So it's a certain, I would call it a cleaning, housekeeping aspect that has been reinforced. And Whereas the US and the Anglo-American countries in general, from a legal point of view, have looked at information governance for a long time due to e-discovery and other issues that they have to deal with. In Europe, this wasn't so much in focus and their GDPR has given us a real push to treat data as an asset and see what we can do with it in the future. Anna, to, to what extent would you agree? Uh, good afternoon, Frederick, and uh, good afternoon to your audience. Um, yeah, I mean, I think from a regulatory perspective, firstly, one of the biggest benefits of the GDPR uh, has been that it's really brought into focus the central issue of trust and fairness for individuals and, and the critical nature of, of user expectations. So any data economy is, by its very nature, going to be 
dependent on users and consumers and customers sharing their data, but people won't do that um, if they don't trust a, a company or a service provider. So I think trust and expectations go hand in hand. And in terms of the GDPR, I think that boils down crucially to transparency amongst other things that people know um, uh, that their data is, is going to be used fairly, that they're aware that if they share it with a company or an organization, uh, that they don't feel hoodwinked or misled or manipulated um, in, in some way. And I think insofar as companies can utilize um, you know, their own demonstration of, of compliance with um, the GDPR to show that they're trustworthy and uh, that they say what they do and, and they do what they say with people's data, that is going to encourage trust um, amongst user populations. Um, and ultimately that should drive greater engagement with the company's products and services. And, and, and obviously then push that pushes through to all aspects of the data economy. And then I think I'd also say, secondly, um, another important, um, uh, I suppose, uh, consequence of the GDPR uh, as a driver for the data economy has been that it's highlighted that the data economy isn't necessarily the personal data economy. It doesn't necessarily have to be personal data that is in scope. Um, and, and the rigor, I think, of GDPR compliance um, in, in terms of, you know, it's, it's Article 5 principles like data minimization and retention and, um, and purpose limitation and compatibility of further processing amongst many other things means that organizations are really being pushed to innovate around how they can best harness um, the power of big data in areas like research uh, and statistical analysis and machine learning without necessarily using personal data sets. So I think that in turn has brought into focus um, other concepts like um, uh, anonymization and synthetic data um, to the forefront of innovative, me innovative measures um, at the heart of the data economy. Thank you. Let's come to the to the Brussels view, Mr. Jorowski. Well, I can say that uh, from the regulatory point of view, my Irish colleague said uh, precisely what I should say as also as a regulator. So let me go uh, to a slightly higher level and to say that, uh, uh, of course, this is the uh, this is the implementation of the values which uh, we feel as uh, the the basis for being European, being uh, from this civilization, and uh, we have to remember that this is not uh, only. Uh, a law on protection of the data. This is also the law on the free data flow. And this is in the title of the legal act as well. So let's say it uh, creates us the uh, trusted environment for the data flows and awareness of the clients and awareness of the customers of uh, uh, what is in the hands of those who are offering the products and the services to them. And on the side of those who are offering products and services, uh, uh, they were able to ask themselves the questions, what do we have? Why do we have it? What is the quality of what we have? And is it something that our uh, clients, our customers can trust? And even the reaction on the, uh, on the um, contact tracing apps in different countries of Europe shows that the more discussion is around and the more open is the presentation of this strange product, which is uh, proposed by the uh, governments, uh, the bigger is actually the acceptance of that. And probably Germany is a very good example of the country where there was a long discussion, a very hard discussion about uh, uh, this uh, kind of applications. But uh, then the acceptance of that was much bigger. Why? Because we know what do we have. We know who is controlling that. We also know who is supervising. Uh, and this is, this is not only regulatory authorities but also the consumer protection, comp uh, consumer protection organizations, NGOs, uh, scientists. This is a, this is a great uh, idealistic notion, the implementation of values. Anna, um, is it possible easily to transport this idea to the companies you actually that are under your supervision? Um, um, you have to um, uh, assure compliance in those companies, and is the idea of value implementation, is this alive on, on the practical scale? Well, yes, I mean, I think it, it absolutely has to be alive on a practical scale, because if, if companies don't comply with 
these these values that we're talking about in the the very kind of essential building blocks of the GDPR, um, companies will end up with complaints made against them, complaints made to regulators like the Irish DPC. Um, and, and, and so they will then find themselves, you know, at, at the forefront of investigative measures um, and possible en- enforcement measures, you know, at the, at the end of those types of processes. So, I mean, I think that um, based on, I suppose, our regulatory experience, um, you know, with, with complainants and the controllers and processors that we investigate, I do think that the GDPR has has brought this new level of awareness to, I mean, both both data subjects and the public as a whole. I I think if you look across Europe, nearly every single uh, adult in Europe must be aware of the the term GDPR because of all the emphasis and the attention that was given to GDPR, you know, in the lead up to its implementation and since then. And so um, that has driven, you know, this this data subject awareness. Um, And I think the public are much more inclined uh, to complain and to reach out to regulators and that is certainly demonstrated by the much increased level of complaints that we as a data protection authority have received in in the two and a half or so years since GDPR implementation. But I do think um, that then translates into companies being um, more uh, alert to um, consumers' um, fears and and possible frustrations um, with uh, with the practices of those companies, of course, it doesn't always necessarily translate into uh, best behaviour, and and you know complaints continue to be received. But but I think the the um, the question of, of values must be translated into real life, concrete, meaningful um, changes for data prote- for data subjects, because otherwise um, controllers will end up having to to answer to regulators about um, why they haven't done things to the standard that the GDPR requires. As we have a representative of a very important European company uh, here in our round, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Eva if it's um, kind of hard today to convince uh, the board of a multinational company like Bayer to to have the same notion of this this value implementation. Um, Do you have to persuade people to invest in data privacy? No. Uh, it, it's a, such a core requirement for us and has been for a long time. I mean, integrity is a core value of, of a corporation. But outside even our company, I think people have understood that preserving trust and protecting values in the broadest sense is, is key to making privacy happen and convey that trust that Anna just referred to to our customers. We are dealing with, with patients, with farmers, with our business partners, and of course also with our employees and their personal data. So people have long, and not just since GDPR, understood that this is a core core value and core interest of everybody to interact. I think what GDPR has brought is more awareness in the general broader public. So people actually realize that they have a say in their privacy rights where they may in the past not have even realized that. I think we have a, a, a duty to do, which is when it comes to transparency and information, which has become a bit of a well, it's, it's a scare, actually, because if you, you kind of click through the consent forms and, and you feel completely overwhelmed if you read 20 pages, if you ever read them, uh, of being informed about what happens to your data. So I think the obligation on the companies, but also together with the regulators, is to find smart and straightforward ways of informing data subjects, so people concerned, about their rights and what happens. So from from a point of view of an in-house lawyer, I think it is upon the legal profession to think in terms of legal design and other elements to be better able to convey what you actually want to inform about because people will not in the long run at least be happy with reading a 20 page um, Google data privacy information statement. So there is there is room for Im- improvement, but as an industry, I think the value of personal data, namely if you work in life science, has been very long understood and uh, abided by. So that is nothing nothing new. It is more the general awareness which actually helps our cause and where we need to also, of course, uh, meet those expectations that now have been put forward and that people realize they have. Um, in the GDPR, it, it says in the Article uh, 31 that you are obliged to work together with the DPAs. Um, has there been the necessity to write this down in the law, or in your view, has there been a strong connection between industry and DPAs also before GDPR? Um, 
I think there has been this long tradition, depending on which country you work in. I mean, if you have the CNIL, uh, you have a different relationship to your authority than if you work in Germany, where you have 17 different authorities, depending where your headquarters are and, and where you come from. So I think the overall tendency to talk to your authority even earlier uh, has been reinforced by the GPDR, which I think is a good thing, so that you can manage expectations, in particular in the very tight deadlines of, of breach notifications, where in the beginning of a, of a new case, you may not even know what's going on, and it'll take you a while. So staying in connection with the authority to be clear on what they expect and what you can tell them already and what you're still in the process of clarifying, for example, or when you want to start a, a specifically uh, a risky processing and you need to go through a data privacy impact assessment and want to discuss with the authorities. I think companies are well advised to create a positive relationship with their authorities. And the cases I know from my colleagues uh, in, the, in the German industry, they all have built those ties because it, it is helpful for both sides. Uh, from a Brussels point of view, uh, is there a, a kind of uh, alignment visible uh, within the member states, the field of the member states, concerning this, this uh, cooperation issue? Well, the cooperation is much better than it was in the past. Uh, however, I cannot say that everything works perfectly because we have still uh, actually 27 jurisdictions that we are dealing with, plus the special jurisdiction which EDPS has over the institutions. Uh, and uh, for obvious reasons, all the regulators themselves fear independent, but also a little bit independent one from another. Uh, so it was very hard to deal with it in the working party of Article 29, which was gathering all the regulators uh, before, the, uh, before the GDPR. But when the GDPR came, well, there was also the understanding that we are talking about something which should be seen the same in Tallinn and in Lisbon and uh, also in, uh, in uh, Athens and in uh, Dublin. And if we start uh, to implement uh, things in the different way, we will simply look ridiculous because this is the system to, to, to uh, uh, exist uh, all over Europe. But at the same time, I have to say that whenever there is a, there is a discretion left, uh, left for the member states uh, to create something uh, inside the state, uh, uh, according to the to the traditions or the, the uh, let's say the history that uh, exists in this country the answer starts to be different and the best example for me is the age of minors uh, to, to, to give the consent well there was a margin of maneuver left for the member states from 13 to 16 because there are different cultures and different uh, laws uh, around europe but then we finished with the situation where on the uh, opposite sides of this pendulum so are Lithuania and Latvia, Czech Republic and Slovakia, Austria and Germany, the, the Netherlands and Belgium. Well, these countries are very similar to each other, but the political differences and also the, 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 the way the discussion was uh, uh, held in the implementation shown that uh, uh, we can give the different answers and the very uh, hard role at the moment uh, for the European Commission for the governments and for the regulators themselves is start to speak the same way about uh, all the solutions, no matter if you uh, think about the market like the German one or the one like Maltese. Uh, Anna, uh, this, this um, historic lines that um, Wojciech spoke of, um, what about Ireland? Um, did the GDPR bring a kind of disruptive revolution to the tradition of uh, data protection supervision in your country? Um, well, I mean, I suppose, there, as Wojciech has alluded to, under the Article 29 Working Party, um, the, you know, the directive called for that degree of cooperation and alignment and, um, a, a, and sharing of approaches between data protection authorities. So I think that the GDPR really takes that initial uh, building block and develops it further in the in the more sophisticated structures and the and the more kind of cohesive structure structures that we now see around um, the concept of the lead supervisory authority, uh, the concerned supervisory authority, the one stop shop function, um, and I suppose in terms of the the change management process that we as an organisation, like every other regulator in Europe, has 
had to go through um, to evolve and bring our um, our own functions and our own way of working into line with the GDPR. I mean, I think it was inevitable that there was some degree of um, of change, and if you want to call it disruption, maybe it was that. But I mean, it, it was, I suppose, the alignment process whereby we would start to look at, for example, you know, the 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 role that we take on in, in many cases as lead supervisory authority and and how we um, work within um, the structures of Article 60 uh, to bring cases to the EDPB. There's been a lot of, um, I suppose, thought and work and development that has gone into that um, in the lead up to the GDPR. And indeed, since then, as, um, as the principles based approach of the GDPR has begun to bed down in the practices of the EDPB um, and, and as as data protection authorities start to work together and, and to kind of start to work in, in step with each other on, on uh, cross-border processing cases in particular. And uh, do you see kind of a competition between the member states to uh, have the best uh, site, the best place for a company to build a new data related business model on or is uh, the, kind, the state of harmonization uh, gone further already? No, I don't think I would say that there is competition amongst um, data protection authorities. Each data protection authority um, is bound by the tasks that are set out in Article 57 of the GDPR. We all have the same job to do. Um, insofar as there are different um, entities, I suppose, that fall within the scope of the lead supervisory authority role across, um, you know, across different DPAs, uh, I think the one-stop shop is is obviously um, a mechanism by which um, a, a uniform approach must ultimately have to be taken. I mean, that was the ultimate objective of the one-stop shop, um, that there would be um, a, a level of harmonization that um, one organization would have one decision from, um, you know, that represented essentially the views of, of the EDPB as a whole, rather than being subject as it was under the old um, data protection directive system of, of multiple um, uh, regulatory views and potentially regulatory actions. I think the question was rather about the governments, not about the regulators that, that, that much. And here I would say that uh, we shouldn't overestimate uh, the role of the data protection law uh, in this sense. Uh, the, the companies are not choosing the place where they are established uh, according to the data protection law. There are some, uh, let, let's say, slightly more uh, influential differences between the countries uh, that might uh, have uh, the effect. And this is, uh, uh, of course, uh, Start, starting from the cultural things and finishing with the tax law or, or the internal competition law that exists in the, in the country. So uh, data protection has uh, the, uh, the value here, but I think that the differences between the uh, member states are not big. This is anyway harmonized uh, uh, model. And uh, do, do not overestimate. The world is not turning around the data protection because the the, the, da the data is not something that we are uh, defending. We are defending human being. And the human being is not only the data about the human. It's also the environment the, place, uh, the person leaves, uh, the features the societies have, uh, the, the, uh, the, the education and uh, hundreds of other things which are to be taken into consideration. So data is important, but let's not overestimate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for putting us some back to the ground, of course. But what, what is your view on the member states and also on their governments when it comes to promote the GDPR as a driver for the data economy? Is this done already? Is this done partially? Or is this a task that, that has to be done in the future? It will never be done perfectly, you know. The awareness can be raised all the time. But uh, to be frank, uh, I'm not in the position as the European Data Protection Supervisor to assess and to, to uh, give a marks and credits to the governments. That's not our role. I may only say that all the governments uh, took their uh, initiatives, all the governments tried to help the uh, regulators. The results are different uh, from country to country. Uh, but uh, we may say that uh, there are the uh, there is a general awareness also among the politicians and among the rule makers uh, about the um, expectations that the society have has uh, as far as the privacy protection is concerned and the part of that is the data protection but also as the security of the 
uh, of the uh, transaction security of the information is concerned. Because as, as it was said in the beginning, uh, data protection is actually the, the part of the bigger things, which is the cybersecurity in different uh, way of uh, thinking about it. And uh, we have to admit there is no cybersecurity without uh, data protection and no data protection without security, uh, cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. From the uh, industry point of view, um, what uh, incentives in the GDPR from the GDPR could be stressed some more in order to um, raise the view on perspectives and chances of data protection law? What about the instruments of self-regulation, for example? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of elements which where we can still make quite a bit of progress. Um, when you look at uh, privacy enhancing technologies, in particular, at terms like anonymization and pseudonymization, we still have a way to go. And we've been discussing in, across German industry, at least quite a bit uh, on self-regulation, so code of conduct in the area of anonymization. But that's quite a touchy and difficult topic because it depends also a lot of the industry sector you're talking about. Because if you're, if you're trying to pseudonymize or anonymize health data, for example, that calls for other mechanisms than just anonymizing standard personal data, if I may say so. So there is room for that. Um, and we have to balance the, the positive effects that could have, which is again, harmonization and working on it from a perspective of those who are affected, given a certain industry sector, for example. And there's of course the downside of over-regulation. So we, we have to kind of balance that, but I think the first steps are being made. What would really be helpful if, if the corresponding authorities, such as the, in, in our case, the European Medicines Agency, um, it would be helpful if we get sector specific codification uh, to, to treat personal data of a specific kind in the same way across the industry, but also across the countries, of course. It becomes a very complex topic if you think of data that goes along a very long value chain. So if you think of the automotive industry, where the personal data captured by a car is then processed over a longer period uh, of the supply chain or the, the industry cycle as such, then you really have to get together a lot of players and stakeholders to get into a, a code regulation that is actually helpful and doesn't just complicate matters. So I think there's room to be we had when we uh, to be ca captured. When we started GDPR, in parallel, we started a project on anonymization because of course, as soon as we can claim and solidly defend that a certain data set is anonymous, then we are into a space where we can work with data that used to be personal uh, in a way that helps our innovation and, and, and product development cycles. And in life science, very often at least, uh, we've seen in the past that we had gathered data many years ago and we wanna look at it again for a different purpose and come to new innovation. And that is difficult if you cannot assess those data from, from the past because they're considered personal data. So that there is a lot to be done in that area of privacy enhancing technologies and a common understanding that people across industries and with the regulators then share. And concerning the, of, yes, please. Building on what Eva said, I would add that uh, the, the self-regulation and co-regulation was definitely a big role to play. When we were creating uh, the text of the GDPR, we heard from the industry, do not over-regulate. We know better how is the, what is the business model, how it should look to go, uh, how it should work. And they are right. I have no clue what is the business model in the energy sector because I simply don't have enough uh, experience for that. Mm -hmm. So how is to create uh, for, for anybody the, the, the detailed rules about that? So do not over-regulate. And then when GDPR went on, we started to hear the call where are the templates? Where are the checklists? And the answer is there will be no checklists and no templates in the legal acts. You think they are useful for your, uh, for your industry? Create them, consult them with the regulators and let's tr uh, try to prepare something which will be describing your kind of business, your kind of making money, your kind of making uh, the, the good for the society. Oh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Sorry, just to, to come in there as well, just to say I completely agree with what Wojciech is saying. 
Obviously, um, schemes like codes of conduct and certification are very important um, accountability tools for organisations. But I think that there is this something of a misconception, perhaps, that they'll be the panacea to demonstrate compliance for organisations across the board um, and across all elements of, of the GDPR. And obviously, you know, they, they are focused on, on particular elements. I mean, certification applies to the products and services that are uh, engaged in the processing of personal data and codes of conduct are, are are directed at very um, uh, definite elements of, of GDPR compliance. So I think that while um, there's been an awful lot of chatter amongst industry, you know, as asking questions of regulators, when will we see finalization of, of the structures in place that are needed to enable um, the operationalization of codes of conduct and, and certification schemes, that equally there, there's a challenge and there's a bit of thinking for industry uh, and various sectors to do to, to consider um, how they will actually, um, I suppose, further harness the powers of those um, accountability tools and be able to demonstrate um, to their own users and consumers and customers what the benefit to them is in that particular organization um, adhering to a particular code of conduct or, or a particular scheme. So I think um, you know, th that is an important other aspect to it that while there's the, the issue of regulatory compliance, come back to the, the start of the conversation that we had, and um, that issue of trust amongst consumers, consumers and users will have to be able to understand how adherence to those types of accountability tools will actually improve their own position and enhance their own um, facilitation of their rights and, and their own protections as data subjects. Okay, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Wojciech. I think we have uh, where this was possible within these few minutes uh, we, we had for this session, give a first notion of how data protection can become a driver, when it is not a driver yet, can become a good driver of the data con economy in Europe. We have to foster self-regulation, we have to foster harmonization, and uh, we never have to forget the core of it, the implementation of values. Thank you all, and um, yes, now on the schedule. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.